Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you again for joining on this week's At the Corner of Cyber and Blog. This is your host, John Gormley. We are deeply honored beyond every measurable point of having Mr. Craig Tiffany on today. Good morning, Craig. How are you today? Good morning, John. Doing great. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Just looking uh, at those pictures, that looks like a couple of pictures that are a little bit younger versions of you. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Yeah, but we'll, we'll roll with it just the same. <laughs> but first of all, before we get into it, Craig, you have been a friend. You have been a mentor for over 25 years. It's been a pleasure knowing you, working with you, working for you, learning from you. Um, you know, your mentorship has made such a difference in my career over the years. Uh, and anytime I get a chance to spend quality time with you, it's absolutely wonderful. Hey, thank you so much. So kind of you. I mean, it's everything you've learned from me, I've learned from you as well. I really appreciate the, the friendship um, and the camaraderie over the years. So I'm glad to be here. Glad to be part of the podcast. Oh, thank you. And first of all, before we get into the whole directorship and you know, cradle point, you got to give me the word. I got to hear it one more time. Yes! <laughs> so the man who put the S in security at Cisco so many years ago. So, you know, before we get into some of the more current things, I think one of the funny things about the story of you yelling security when we all worked at Cisco many years ago, can you kind of tell the, a little bit of the story of why you did that? Why did Absolutely. you do that, that one day? So, so it was 1999, 2000, not to date ourselves. <laughs> uh, but I had just taken over um, as the security specialist for Southern California. Actually, mm -hmm. it was for the area. At the mm -hmm. time, I was the only one. Um, I'd actually just been come off being an SE, and my boss had said, do you want to, you know, we, we'd close some offices due to the dot-com bust. Right. And he said, my boss at the time, Chris White, said, hey, do you want to be the uh, consulting engineer for security? And I said, frankly, Chris, I, I don't. Um, if there's just one of us, I want to be the sales guy because he right. gets paid a lot more. If I'm be doing, oh, I'm doing it, then by God, make me the sales guy. Right. So he said it, through several conversations, he said yes. But I quickly found out that I had no brand whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we, security at the time was access control list, yeah. fixed firewall, and we just bought the wheel group for IDS and yep. IPS. That's right. Based. Um, and so at any event where someone would say, so we'd be in a room of, you know, a couple hundred people or a thousand mm -hmm. people. And someone would say, and one of the topics today is security. I would just get up and yell. Security! <laughs> and everyone would turn around and look at me. And it was funny. Um, and that was kind of the idea was to get that, that branding down. But at the same time, it, there was a lot of seriousness in it that I needed to let everyone know who I was, mm -hmm. how to contact me and how to get out there and sell stuff. And we had, you came on board soon after that, yep. and we we actually grew that that group from. You know, I think we did eight million the first yep. year I was in it, and I think we did thirty seven million the yep. second, and soon it was a hundred million. So we yep. grew that incredibly quickly as a team. Uh, I met with a guy uh, just yesterday, Richard Palmer. Oh one yes, of no, Richard. Yeah, of on, uh, when we when we uh, hired from Checkpoint, uh, half their organization. It was just great to you know. Hey, we were right back to the old conversation and, and talked about how we we know we we ran the world time selling fixed firewalls yeah <laughs> no no and the reason i ask is that it's you know a lot of times people ask me well how do you get visibility how do you get your product out there how do you how do you open people's minds and doors to products especially say where there's so many startup security products running around and try to compete with you know the cisco's and the palos i said it's all about that 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 yelling it's all yep. about that visibility it's getting that word out there yep and that, that helped us actually grow in the wireless space as well. I know this isn't a wireless podcast, but at the time, you know, I didn't have any headcount to hire wireless people. So, you know, talking with you guys, we figured out, hey, let's do a, do you want fries with that deal? So whenever, whenever anyone bought a Cat 5000 or Cat 6000 switch, we threw in a couple of access points. And Absolutely. it was a hey, first one's free type model. <laughs> and we were able to grow that significantly as well, you know, as a team, figuring out that branding and figuring out that plan to get the, get the products out there. Well, that's something that's important that stays with you for your entire career, right? You establish your brand, you establish what you what you stand for, you know, where you kind of build your name in the market. I think you built your name not only in the market and security, but everywhere. You and I worked at Citrix together. You know, you were definitely deep in the Netscaler and also the VDI space as well. And as you went on to all the other career places you've worked on, you've managed to build the brand. But I think it's your enthusiasm and your energy. And, and when I see a lot of the younger people in our space that are like, well, don't read the PowerPoints. Put those away for a moment. Talk about what your value is for the customer. Be relevant. And when you were screaming that word so many times, what people don't realize is back then, they were Cisco was doing handset counts every Friday. How many handsets did you sell for IP telephony? Yeah. It's like, how do you compete with that? You know, yeah. it's like so they saw the 
the voice market being here and they saw the security market kind of being there. And then I came from content, which was here. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's security, whatever. But then when we started losing, remember, we started losing like the net screen and some of these other players. Yep. Well, how did we lose? You have one and a half people on this product right now. You got a thousand people on voice. Of course, you're not going to yeah. win the market. So I think Cisco learned his lesson. It's interesting you mentioned Richard Palmer because Richard was a VP of the product. And we kept going to him going, you need to spend a little more money, pal. Yeah. <laughs> you got to run yeah. more seminars and we can't get the word out there anymore. Absolutely. Yeah, it was it was a challenging time. And the other thing was you'd always get, um, yeah, we're, we're off topic, but you'd get the conversation with the account exec who would say, just hold off on that security conversation until I get my switch sale done. It was like, well, I'm so glad you had the conversation with Checkpoint and they're not going to sell while you get your, your switch point deal done, your switch done. Yeah. And they look at me and go, what do you mean? I haven't talked to Checkpoint. I said, exactly. Please. They're selling. I'm going to go sell. We're talking to different people. Let's go. Yeah, no, you 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 summed it up well because being overlays and I, I always, you know, again, part of being in this space as long as we have, people don't remember that overlays is really what saved a lot of these bigger deals. It was the specialization. It was the people that went in and said, okay, we're in a security meeting. The core team may not have the same language or capability. The overlays really had that. I know Cisco always struggled with, you know, we don't need overlays. We don't need this. It wasn't until they started losing those really big deals because people would come in with a net screen partnership or a checkpoint partnership and they would own it. They would come in and own that space. Are you now seeing the same thing being a cradle point now? I mean, it's sort of, you're still in the security base a little bit. You're now doing 4G and 5G, you're doing LTE, you're putting devices all over the place for different cases. But are you now seeing that being that specialist in a 4G and 5G world is, is important and valuable or has it really become just a commodity technology? No, it's absolutely so important. And it's actually what we're doing in the 4G and 5G space mm -hmm. is expanding at such a rate with new technologies like private cellular network or CBRS, Citizens Band Radio uh, Services. Um, we're having to create our own specializations inside the specialization of mm -hmm. 5G and 4G. Uh, when you start to talk about, hey, I want to put a private cellular network out there on 5G uh, and I want quality of service. When people think of something like quality of service, they think of a fixed pipe. Exactly. I know I have X amount and I can reserve X amount for voice traffic, mm -hmm. which was a very popular one, or IBM traffic mm -hmm. that was time sensitive, something like that. But you always have that fixed pipe. In the wireless space, you don't always have a fixed pipe because it's still a shared medium. Right. So if you're not doing a privately sell network and you're, and you're trying to do quality service in an open open network or a shared network, you've got to realize that you're using a pipe that's expanding and contracting, expanding mm -hmm. and contracting. And so when you do reserve bandwidth for specific mm -hmm. things, you understand you might be completely cutting something else off. And it just it increases that conversation significantly. Um, so but it's not just simple, simply, hey, I'm going to do quality of service on here. It becomes a bit more of a, of a conversation. So when I pick up my little favorite phone and I do my thing with it and everything, and it says 5G in the top right corner, is it really 5G or is it really a, a small segment of 5G today? Well, that's, a, that's a great question, John, because it's 5G is significantly different than 4G mm -hmm. and gigabit LTE really is what we're, where, we're, where we're at right now. Um, 4G and gigabit LTE are really in one spectrum. Uh, they, we can pump a, a lot of data still through gigabit LTE. A lot of our customers still rely on gigabit LTE and will continue to do so for the coming years. 4G is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. 5G is different. There are actually three distinct bands, um, which low, medium, and high. And mm -hmm. you know, low, broad, low band, medium band, and high band. In the low band is where you're seeing the coverage maps that you see. Mm -hmm. When you know any one of the big three put up a their 5G coverage map, what they're showing you is that low band. And the low band's great for coverage. It can go through two or three walls. It can go right. from the data center to outside. It's what you typically see from cellular connectivity and cellular mm -hmm. connection. Um, nothing special has to happen to make it work. Mm -hmm. But with that, that persistence and the ability to go through things, you lose bandwidth. I mean, it's 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 physics. It's physics so totally. Through. So you can still get gigabit speeds on that, mm -hmm. but they're. They're really hundreds of megabits right now, uh, mm -hmm. getting close to that gigabit speed. Mm -hmm. And that's where you see most cellular telephones at right now. And are they really on 5G? That's you know, only the uh, only marketing. The Good marketing. <laughs> right. right. Is, is there a 5G uh, signal out there? Yes, there is. But there is. Phone. I'm not saying I'm not saying anything. You know, it's 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 they know whether or not it's there. You, you can tell by, by the throughput. 
But then the, where 5G becomes interesting is as we move up the ladder. Further, when okay. we move into the mid band, uh, it's also called the C band, the Cinderella band, the, the coverage band, or the, the, the throughput band. Mm -hmm. um, I now have the ability to go through a couple of walls or glass or, or leaves on trees and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I can get over a gig. I can get two gig, you know, in, in great situations. I can get a lot more throughput through that, through that device. Mm -hmm. Now, when we start to see these really at, um, at different deployments, you can get these with inter internal deployments, but where we're seeing real good throughput and real good connectivity is when we actually put something on a roof. The penetration, put it, put an actual device on the roof that is yeah. is sealed and it's doing things mm -hmm. at a much higher speed. Um, and this is where we see uh, the autonomous vehicles connecting to, uh, mm -hmm. and things like that in city centers and in other areas like that. So then we go to the ultra high band, high band or ultra high band uh, mm -hmm. that's above uh, it's above seven gigahertz. Mm -hmm. it's, it's higher band. Uh, the throughput is huge. I can do amazing things with a throughput. The challenge is, is it's got to be site to site. It's got to be, you know, eye to eye. I got to be able, the radio has to be able to see the receiver. It can't go through a pane of glass. Heavy rainstorm can cause a challenge uh, for it. So it's, it's got to be used correctly. The good news is a lot of the devices that are deployed today, a lot of the radios, not just from us, but from our players as well, mm -hmm. we start talking about ultra high band. They have the capability to also adjust, adjust down, similar. Adjust down uh, okay. as needed. So you've got the ability. So it's when we talk with customers and they say, hey, I saw that XYZ commercial. They got <laughs> three gigabits of throughput. Um, and that's what I want from my device inside right. a closet, inside a mall. Right. Uh, why am I not seeing that? And you say, well, what you're not seeing is the phone's here. The camera's right in front of them. The antennas or the radio's right exactly. above Right them. on his head. Yeah, Looking exactly. Right down on top yeah. of them. And that's that's the big difference that, that we've got in this space. And um and that's what, but that's what's making it interesting. The uh, the explosion of five G has has been pretty amazing uh, mm -hmm. over the last six to nine months. Um, because once again, four G is not going anywhere. Five G is not even fully deployed, not even close. There's you know some of the vendors are ahead of it, some of them are behind. But mm -hmm. what we're seeing is customers saying, "Hey, if a device costs X amount uh, for four G LTE and five uh, G's." You know, ten percent more, twenty percent more, whatever that number is. Why wouldn't I just deploy that instead? Which exactly. we didn't expect because a lot of these customers typically don't go that way. They say, "What's good enough?" But they're seeing that the future is coming quicker than they anticipated. Yes. So let's talk about autonomous cars for a moment, because obviously during my time at BlackBerry, you know, there was a big talk about QNX and the cars being autonomous and driving by themselves. But they also mentioned there was a dependency on five G for it to communicate with the traffic lights, the cameras, the ability to know where the local hospital was, if there was a medical emergency. Are we anywhere close to any any of that nirvana as far as having autonomous cars using a 5G in a city environment? Or is it going to be years away before we can have the resiliency on the network to have 10, 20, 30 autonomous cars driving by themselves using the 5G to sort of intercommunicate? Or can they technically do it today, but knowing it just may not be as reliable? Yeah, so this is where I'm going to put the caveat, and this is Craig Tiffany's opinion, not the <laughs> Forgot I put that on the next time. <laughs> um, I think in some instances we can. Uh, we, we, we could do that today. Uh, but the challenge really is is the, is the consistency and, and, the, and the coverage. Um, there's a lot of companies out there that are working on this and trying to make this work um, beyond the ones you know, the names right. you hear. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more doing it. Where we're seeing real traction is really on things like factory floors, where you've got autonomous uh, robots uh, that are moving material from station to station uh, or doing delivery uh, of product and then actually constructing product and where that construction is in a very fixed, very uh, controlled environment. Uh, is what we're Predict seeing. Predictable. We're seeing. predictable, very predictable. predictable. The robot right. knows exactly where it's going. Yeah. And where we're seeing the most success with a lot of the customers is they're using a private cellular network. Mm -hmm. And what that means is they actually buy the cells that, that produce the, uh, uh, that are the radios. They're sending it out and our devices are receiving them on the shop floor. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's becoming very analogous to Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. uh, they had used Wi-Fi before and Wi-Fi is good 
but it's not as robust yeah. uh, as a PCM uh, radio signal mm-hmm. um, that's going out. So that's, it, we, yeah, we're getting there, but it's not, it's not going to be tomorrow. Uh, it's not going to be next year, but you, but you're seeing neighborhood vehicles, uh, yeah. NEVs, neighborhood electric vehicles yeah. that are, uh, are autonomous and are doing deliveries, mm-hmm. uh, are low speed, um, you know, that just from a safety factor, yeah. um, they continue to grow like that. And that's, you know, getting more into the other aspects of the of the autonomy is you know, outside the spectrum of what I know. Uh, yeah. That it's really into, hey, let's have a beer and talk about it. Uh, sure. Great conversation time versus talking about what I do know about. That's, how, yeah. how does how is AI and machine learning now coming into play in this? I know you've got the connectivity component, you've got the antenna component, you've got the robotics, and then you have the data. So when you look at how your your radios are deployed today, does it report back into a central console? And is there any form of AI that's sort of navigating the data coming off of your radios to say, you know, the signaling is going up, it's going down, it's going up and going down under these conditions? Or has has the market evolved where it's trying to use AI more or is it still just more of a just a collection point and a you know simple reporting point? Yeah, that's kind of getting to the secret sauce of our product of, of the NetCloud Manager, um, mm-hmm. of where it's using AI. And they don't really share that with us very much. You can kind of perceive mm-hmm. where we play in the AI is really the delivery of information mm-hmm. um, in an IoT space where there's a lot of things going on, where they're collecting a lot of data, doing mm-hmm. stuff. We have direct connections into Azure's, mm-hmm. Azure's AI environment, as mm-hmm. well as Google's and, and Amazon's. Uh, so we can connect directly into those. So we're more about the transport of the AI, I think, than the use of the AI. That doesn't mean it's not built into our systems, specifically on connectivity and making those connections. Um, but we're that's not a big part of what we're what we're promoting. So, so it's interesting. You just mentioned Internet of Things. So I know there's this kind of convergence going on right now in the OT space, in the ICS space, and along with the IoT space inside of factories and water control systems, where these networks used to be closed loop air gap networks that just kind of ran into their own little serial world. But now because people want to be able to collect the data from those devices and communicate them up to the cloud, they have to become IP enabled. Are you starting to see more and more 5G as a primary means of connectivity into these factories, or are they still relying upon MPLS, SD WAN, or some of the other functionality of WAN? Or do you really see 5G being the primary connection point for the many? Yeah, displays? so it's, it's a great question. It depends on industry. So, from a manufacturing standpoint and things like that, um, where an SD WAN is deployed, where an MPLS network mm-hmm. is deployed, more on the SD WAN side, we become a gateway of last resort. So, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter how intelligent your network is, once that fiber gets pulled up by a backhoe, uh, you're down. <laughs> I don't care how smart, how, how much software de- definition you're doing, your network's yeah. down. So we've become gateway of last resort. Um, we do now have solutions that are SD-WAN involved, but I don't want to, this isn't about credit point, this is more about the technology. So mm-hmm. when you, but when you see these things, we see a lot, the the biggest movement right now is in that failover space, where the, it's that okay. tertiary, you've got a primary and a backup. Uh, but once again, if you lose the Terra-based network, you've got to have something that's wireless. And that's where people that we do, you know, our company and people we compete with that Mm -hmm. do this as a, it's what we do every day. We're Mm -hmm. seeing incredible growth in that. Folks Mm -hmm. that are slapping in adapters and things like that, it's not quite as much growth because it's not purpose built. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing is in some retail, in some locations where the customer owns their own building, Mm -hmm. this is kind of the key thing is they own their own building. We're seeing the 5G become 5G and 4G LTE gigabit 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 LTE. We're mm-hmm. seeing that become primary. Primary. Wow. So yeah. not yeah. not ISDN, not replacements, not dial up. Right. You guys really are the primary. So you got to take an example. We've got one large customer I can't name, but they've got fifteen thousand locations throughout the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, up until now, those fifteen thousand locations were served by six thousand ISPs. <laughs> Every region, every area, they had to negotiate an MSA with every one of those ISPs. Wow. And so not just dollars, but resources, time, yeah. people, attorneys having to review those on an annual or triannual basis was overwhelming. And they'd been testing the wireless for quite a while. When 5G came out and mm-hmm. they they literally looked at our, our external device and they owned their own buildings. Thank so God. once that was there... Uh, and they could do it. They cut all ties. They now negotiate three MSAs a year 
um, and they've got multiple uh, methods. So they've got it's not just one radio. Uh, you know, it's it's not, sorry, not just one modem. It's mm -hmm. two to four modems on every building. But again, what we're dealing with is three different carriers versus six thousand. Incredible. So and so, just the the cost savings on that. And the thing is, the way it's deployed. Mm -hmm. Those locations can be managed by one person. We have another deployment that's really it's, I, it's essentially IoT retail. Mm -hmm. They've got forty thousand locations, mm -hmm. and one guy manages all forty thousand. Incredible, uh, because you just you, once you get it down, you understand that you get great. He does. He's got two different. Or that person has two different uh, carriers. Mm -hmm. He negotiates two different buckets of, of data, mm -hmm. and then he manages it all from one spot. And mm -hmm. that is significantly different from our old days right. when we ran wide area networks. You know, when we when we went from uh, from hub and spoke uh, to tag switching, which became MPLS, you could never do that uh, really with one person, one pane of glass, because it just it, there's too many moving parts. So one thing interesting you mentioned about backup. So when you and I were first coming up in the WAN space, we used to use ISDN as dial backup to the primary frame relay, mm -hmm. and then it went to MPLS. There was more resiliency, but we still needed a backup. So if 5G, the way you mentioned as a backup, is it metered based upon usage and consumption? So if suddenly it switches over where you lose your primary fiber cut because, you know, somebody dug yep. up the hole. Now you're on the 5G. Does 5G meter based on consumption like ISDN used to, or is it just you're paying a rate for whatever bandwidth committed you were given? Another great question. So it depends. Um, you actually, it depends on the carrier. Mm -hmm. uh, but with most of the carriers today, you can choose a data plan, which is X number of gigabit per month or what mm -hmm. have you, or you can choose a bandwidth mm -hmm. and say, I want 100 megabits uh, per second throughput, and they will throttle based on throughput, but make it unlimited data. Okay. Um, and that has been a huge boom mm -hmm. uh, to going wireless, because that's been one of the biggest barriers really in the 3G and the 4G space was a network goes down home base, home office doesn't realize it. Right. And they are using the cellular connectivity. They're using the data for a week, two weeks before. Rack, they rack, racking, out. racking it up. Yeah. They're just racking up costs. So that unknown, um, you know, in an operational environment is uh, people run from it. It's just not a, it's not a good thing to have a, a device, a, a mechanism that can run unfettered um, uh, without the, without the team knowing it. And it happened quite a few times. It's, it, it has happened. So the carriers, by creating these different plans mm -hmm. that allow for throughput, um, or ones that can conglomerate them um, in, into buckets, and then they can alert. Um, that's one of the things that, you know, again, I can't not talk about our product. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that we do is we, do, we can set thresholds for alerts. Mm -hmm. Like when you get a certain threshold of data in a month uh, mm -hmm. on a specific SIM, mm -hmm. you know, specific carrier SIM, we can alert. We can, we can uh, shut that shut down, but you know, shunt it a little bit. You know, slow down the, the throughput, um, and then eventually we can shut it down uh, if you hit it. You know, it's all configurable. But that's that's becoming less and less of an issue mm -hmm. as we have the ability to um, as the as the carriers have changed their plans, and that's made it. It's That's huge. Huge. Well, it's huge because it shows maturity because when ISDN was a backup, originally, you know, when people people our age can remember this, it started with, a, you know, AOL dial up at 995 a month. And then it kind of moved up to say now DSL came out because it was compression. Then ISDN came out. The problem was is that ISDN was extremely expensive and then it had to shift to kind of more of a backup. The problem was if we activated at the router level, we lost our primary link and they would do a failover in the link and ISDN when activated. We didn't get SNMP traps like we were supposed to. We had no clue that we're running on backup for three weeks until we got the bill from right. PacMy for SBC or whoever was billing us at the time. Whoa, where did this come from? It's because the backup link, or we fluttered between the primary link and the secondary link. So it, it's great to see 20 something years later that having an alternative backup plan can be manageable and cost managed at, at the get go instead of learning you know, the hard knocks a month later. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's really been a game changer. Uh, yeah. From that space, for exactly that reason, you can't right. surprise operations with uh, with expenses. 
No, no, especially it's like, where did that get? It's not even in the budget. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't configure it properly. So how can people get hold of Cradle Point? What's the best way that people can get hold of and learn about where things are going with 5G? So the website's always great, cradlepoint.com. Um, if you are already a, a customer, one thing to mention on that is you have access to all the training that we have. So you can become completely certified on Cradle Point products in the Cradle Point world. That's 5G. That's you know, a lot of different things um, via Cradle Point University through NetCloud Manager. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're look, interested in looking about the products and figuring out things, cradlepoint.com is a great place to go. Mm -hmm. Second thing is if you don't have... Um, you don't have that you don't have a contact you don't know anyone call our 1-800 number which is 1-855-813-3385 mm -hmm. and they will connect you with someone who'll get someone in the field uh, or our inside sales team to give you a call and figure things out we're fully staffed from an inside sales and engineering perspective mm -hmm. it's not just a sales organization you know if you've got technical questions we've got people there who can yeah. answer them and it's been it's it's a great organization headquartered in boise and so that's where all the folks are. But you're also a part of Ericsson, correct? And Ericsson acquire you? Yeah. One of, yeah. So real quickly. So one of the I, I've been acquired uh, and been on the acquiring side quite a few times. <laughs> this is one of the best instances of being acquired that you can have. We had a vertical acquisition where Ericsson, uh, who creates and builds these huge radio transmitters mm -hmm. in the 4G and 5G space, wanted to get down into the receiver side. And so is a vertical integration where they purchased us. Yes. We are still cradle point. We're mm -hmm. actually our CEO reports directly to the CEO of Ericsson mm -hmm. now at this point as the enterprise team. And we are growing pretty massively by that. And so it's it's nice to be able to say, hey, yeah, we might have some advantages on, on go to market because we're talking to the guys who are building the stuff that we're receiving. And yeah. we got guys up here yeah. who are building these cool radios. We're down here with these cool receivers. And we get to talk to him before we release product. What a, what a great That's story. Great. Yeah. great story. Well, Craig, first of all, thank you very much for making time. I know it's end of quarter in the sales cycle and making time for me is always wonderful. It's always great to see you, my friend. And uh, again, thank you for a wonderful years of mentorship and, and partnering and working together as well. Great. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate it. Reach out. Go Cradle Point. Thanks, everybody. Absolutely. Everyone, thank you very much for making on this week's At the Corner of Cyber and Blog. This is your host, John Grunley. Look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.